about some of the crucial elements of contemporary American medicine. In doing so, let me acknowledge and thank President and Mrs. Dennison for their support of this series. I would like to share a brief tale of two physicians from Boston. The first is Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the leading physicians of the 19th century. For many years a professor of, at Harvard Medical School, he criticized some traditional medical practices of his day, and he argued against false reasoning and misrepresentation of scientific evidence. His 1843 paper on childbed fever represented a seminal advance in how women were cared for during childbirth. Holmes lectured throughout the United States on what he perceived to be failings of medical science and practice. He was also a popular poet and writer whose works for the general public appeared in such publications as the Atlantic Monthly, of which he was a founder. The second physician from Boston is our speaker for this evening. Dr. Marcia Angel is a leading physician of contemporary medicine. A graduate of the Boston University School of Medicine, she is currently a senior lecturer in social medicine at Harvard Medical School. She is the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, widely recognized as the world's most prestigious and respected and important medical journal. In part for her medical work, as well as for her other work, she was named by Time Magazine in 1997 as one of the 25 most influential Americans. Like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Dr. Angel has published widely for both professional audiences and for the general public on issues such as medical ethics, law, health policy, clinical research, and end-of-life care. As editor of the New England Journal, she highlighted important issues facing the healthcare professions and our society. She has endeavored to expand public understanding of science. She has challenged us to wrestle with difficult questions. She has, like Holmes, advanced the care of women by bringing attention to such issues as silicone breast implants and patterns of discrimination against women in healthcare research. As a nation, we are now struggling with how to achieve meaningful health care reform. Five bills are slowly working their way through the legislative sausage grinder of Congress. And during this process, we've heard many clamoring voices, many perspectives, many points of view. Among the most strident voices in the current debate are those of the health care industry, and the word industry is telling, I think, and the drug companies. In the middle of the 19th century, Oliver Wendell Holmes argued that if all drugs then in use were tossed into the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. <laughs> Today we have many more effective drugs than we did some 150 years ago. So Dr. Angel might not agree with Dr. Holmes that all of today's drugs should be tossed into the ocean. But she has scrutinized carefully and analyzed critically the pharmaceutical industry, its motivations and its moral responsibilities, its social responsibilities, its ethical and moral behavior toward patients and toward research. She published in 2004 a book titled The Truth About the Drug Companies, How They Deceive Us and What to, to Do About It. This is the topic of her presentation this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marcia Angel. I think my talk is missing. I think you have it. You could have given the talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Swick. Uh, it's really uh, a great honor to have been invited to give this lecture, uh, and an especial pleasure to be invited to come to Missoula uh, and to spend a little time in your beautiful state. 
As I'm sure I don't have to tell you, expenditures on prescription drugs in this country are rising rapidly. Now, this is partly a matter of volume. More people are taking more pills, so naturally expenditures would rise. But it's also a matter of price. The prices of the top-selling drugs are jacked up every year two or three times the inflation rate. Now, the United States is the only advanced country in which that can happen because other countries regulate drug prices in some way, but we don't. The increase in drug expenditures has real consequences for people. As prices soar and insurers increase the copayments, <clears throat> many people are not able to take their full doses as prescribed. They try to play them out uh, by taking half a dose or share prescription drugs with their spouses. And some people don't even bother to fill the prescriptions in the first place. They just can't do it. Consequently, public esteem for the pharmaceutical industry in the US is only slightly higher than for the tobacco companies. Adding to the sinking reputation of the industry is the fact that nearly every large drug company has recently paid huge fines to settle charges of illegal activities. This year, Pfizer pleaded guilty to charges of fraudulently marketing drugs and was fined $2.3 billion, that's billion with a B, which included the largest criminal fine ever levied against any company. Pfizer's not unique. Most of the big drug companies have been charged with similar kinds of illegal practices. Moreover, several top-selling drugs, such as Vioxx, were promoted widely after they were known to be unsafe. And in some cases, the manufacturers deliberately suppressed information about the risks. Now, what does the pharmaceutical industry say for itself? It presents itself very differently as a public-spirited scientific enterprise. It maintains that its primary purpose is to discover important, innovative drugs and bring them to market and that it does so at considerable risk. It also maintains that prices must be high to cover its huge research and development, that is R&D, costs. This implies that drug companies spend most of their sales income on R&D and afterwards have only enough left over for modest profits. Is any of that true? In my remaining time, I'll present an overview of the industry, which, as you'll see, is very different from the way it presents itself. Then I'll close with a few words about its enormous influence on medical practice and public policy, particularly the current health reform efforts. This slide is an overview of the top 10 drug companies in the world last year. These 10 companies dominate the industry in the sense that they are responsible for roughly a little over 40% of all prescription drug sales in the world. Uh, last year, these data are for 2008, last year the total prescription drug sales was about $725 billion. The sales for these 10 companies was $310 billion. Now, one thing to notice from this slide is that this is not an American industry. It's a global industry. Of the top 10 companies, five are American, but five are European. 
And the companies are, the biggest company in the world, drug company in the world, is Pfizer, which last year had sales of, uh, it was a little over $43 uh, billion. Uh, but the second drug company is a British company, GlaxoSmithKline. The third is a Swiss company, Novartis. The fourth is a French company, Sanofi Aventis. Uh, the fifth is another British company, AstraZeneca. The sixth is a Swiss company, Roche. And then there are four American companies, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Abbott, and Lilly. So this is a global industry. <clears throat> the drugs themselves are manufactured all over the world. Pfizer has 60 manufacturing plants in 32 countries located sometimes for tax purposes. There are several uh, plants in Ireland, uh, sometimes for cheap labor and, and third world, world companies. I mention that because the drugs themselves are flying over borders all the time, and yet Americans are invited to believe that a drug will turn to poison by virtue of crossing the Canadian border. If you look at the annual reports of these 10 companies, and I've spent a lot of time doing that, you find that they are much the same, that there's not much difference among them. Some of them are bigger than others, some of their annual reports are expressed in dollars, some in Swiss francs, some in uh, pounds, uh, but they're similar in the sense that they all spend a similar percentage of their revenues on marketing and administration, a similar percentage on research and development, a similar percentage they keep at the end of the day as profit. So they're very similar. They behave very similarly. Uh, another similarity is that for most of them, the United States is their major profit center. Because as I said, we are the only country that does not regulate drug prices in some way so that the same brand name drugs cost on average twice as much in the United States as they do in Europe and Canada. So the drug companies, in a sense, like to pass themselves off in their PR as American. They don't do this explicitly, of course, but implicitly they imply that this is an American industry. And I think that's why many of us tend to believe that it is. Uh, the trade association of the industry is called the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma. But that's misleadingly named because it consists of about 30 companies, the biggest companies all over the world. But I mention this because uh, GlaxoSmithKline makes Paxil. Who knew the Paxil was made by a British company? Or um, AstraZeneca makes uh, Nexium. Who knew that Nexium was made by another British company? So this is a global industry that has the United States as its major profit center. This slide is a little bit different from uh, the first one. Uh, it shows just the top 10 American companies. And these were the companies that were listed last year in Fortune magazine's rankings of the top uh, 500 uh, companies in the United States, the Fortune 500. Uh, this also concerns all sales of these 10 companies and not just sales of prescription drugs. Now, in most cases, it amounts to the same thing, but companies like Johnson & Johnson, for example, sell many other consumer products. So the top 10 American companies, oops, hmm. Uh, the top 10 American companies consisted of uh, last year of Johnson & Johnson was number one, then Pfizer, Abbott, Merck, Wyeth, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Lilly, Sharing Plow, Amgen, and Gilead Sciences. The last two are technically biochemical, I mean uh, biotech companies, but they act very much like the large drug companies. Uh, this may be the most important slide I'm going to show you tonight because it shows you the vital st statistics of these top 
10 American drug companies. The first thing to notice is the phenomenal profit margin. Last year, these 10 companies had profits of $49 billion. They had sales of 269, I think that says, but profits of 49 billion, or 18% of their sales income. That compares with less than 1% last year for all of the Fortune 500 companies. 18% versus less than 1%, 0.9%. So this is a phenomenally profitable industry. It's consistently among the top most profitable industries in the Fortune 500. The Fortune 500 is broken down into 50 separate, around 50 separate industries. And the pharmaceutical industry is almost always number one or two. I think one year it was number three. Last year it was number two. Uh, consistently among the most profitable of the Fortune 500 industries. So how can this be a risky industry if year after year it's number one or two in the country? The next thing to notice is the huge expenditures on marketing and administration. Last year that amounted to $83 billion or about a third of their sales income went to marketing and administration. Now, these two things are lumped together in the annual reports and the SEC filings, and very few companies will separate those two things out. I'm not sure why they do lump them together, except that either one alone would be so large as to be embarrassing that I think they just kind of squish them together. Um, but uh, there is reason to believe, I won't go through the estimates, but there's reason to believe that last year when the total for marketing administration was $83 billion, $70 billion went to marketing, $13 billion, this is roughly, $13 billion went to administration. Now I'm going to come back to the marketing budget later. And finally, notice this. 41 billion for research and development, or 15 percent of the sales income. Now, 41 billion is a lot of money, but it's less than half what they spent on marketing and administration, and it's less even than they kept in profits after all of their other expenditures. So, when drug companies say that high prices are necessary to cover their high R&D costs, that's not quite true. Their high prices are really necessary to cover their enormous marketing and administrative expenditures and to maintain their obscene profits. This is maybe the most important take home message for this evening. Now, what are we getting for all of this money? What is the output of this industry? This shows the output for the pharmaceutical industry over the eight years, uh, 2000 through 2007. And I have to give you a little background first. Before a drug can be sold in this country, it has to be approved by the FDA wherever it's made. I mean, if it's made in a Swiss company, they all want to sell. In, in the United States because it is such a, a rich profit center. So all of their drugs have to be approved by the FDA in order to go on the market here. Approval depends on the company demonstrating in clinical trials that their new drug is reasonably safe and effective. But compared with what? They don't have to compare their new drugs with existing drugs to treat the same condition. They merely have to compare their new drug with a sugar pill, with a placebo, so that the drug merely has to be better than nothing. Nothing is what the sugar pill is. And this is a very low standard. People usually think that FDA approval means that a drug offers something better, that it wouldn't come on the market. 
unless it offers something better. But for, for all we know, every drug that comes on the market to treat a, a particular condition is worse than the one before. We have no way of knowing. Is it better? Is it worse? Or is it much the same? All we know is that it's likely to be more effective than a placebo. When the FDA classifies the drugs it reviews, it, it does so. When it, when it reviews a, a new drug application, it classifies the drug in two important ways. First of all, it classifies the drug uh, in terms of whether it's a new drug at all. That's called a new molecular entity, NME. Whether it's a new molecular entity or whether it's just an old drug, uh, often in combination with another old drug, then they get a new patent and they call it something different, uh, or maybe a new dosage form. So the FDA classifies it. You can see it on their website. Is this a new drug, a new molecular entity, or is it not a new molecular entity? And the second way that the FDA classifies drugs it reviews is according to whether it's likely to be an improvement over existing drugs already on the market to treat the same condition. So let's look at the yield over those uh, eight years. In those eight years, uh, there were 667 new drugs approved that came on the market. But only, is this working? Seems to, well, only uh, about 25% were new molecular entities at all. That's in the column on the left. The other 75% were simply old drugs, rejiggered in, in some way. And even more startling, only about 20% were considered likely to represent improvements over existing drugs already in the market. And they are the 75 in red of the new molecular entities and the 49 in red of the non-new molecular entities. These 20% were considered likely to be improvements. The 80% were considered unlikely to be improvements. There were already drugs on the market that do about the same thing. So, in terms of innovation, over those eight years, only about 11% could be considered truly innovative. And those are the 75 uh, that were new molecular entities judged likely to be improvements. Only those 75 out of the total of 667. The 446 in the column on the right, the blue, were drugs that were not new drugs, and not considered likely to be improvements. This is the major output of this mighty industry. These are drugs that are called Me Too drugs. And this is the major output of the industry. They are trivial variations on existing drugs. There are whole families or classes of Me Too drugs. You have probably all heard of Lipitor, it's a Me Too drug, one of six very similar cholesterol-lowering drugs of the statin type. You've also probably heard of Celexa, also a Me Too drug, one of five antidepressants of the SSRI type. Since Me Too drugs are rarely compared with others in the same class at equivalent doses, there's no way to know whether one is better or worse than another. Probably there's the same, but there's no way to know. Why are Me Too drugs the major output of the pharmaceutical industry? First, they cash in on already established lucrative markets. They tend to target vague, chronic conditions in essentially normal people. Conditions like erectile dysfunction, or acid reflux, or shyness. Why? Because there are more normal people than sick ones. That's Economics 101. It's a big market. 
Moreover, these markets can be readily expanded because the conditions are usually vague and often impossible to define objectively. You may have noticed that many drug ads promote the condition more than the drug. You'll see an ad that's really an ad for heartburn. If you have heartburn, you may have a serious disease of the esophagus, and you better take some Nexium. It's the, the condition that's being promoted. What they're trying to do is convince people that they have something that requires long-term treatment. It's been shown that ads for one Me Too drug increase the sales of other drugs in the same class because more people become convinced that they have the condition. So all of the Me Too's see their sales go up. You can't do that with a serious disease like cancer. You either have it or you don't. You can't convince people that they have it and need long-term treatment. Me Too drugs also target conditions like high cholesterol and high blood pressure, which can have serious consequences, but are not in and of themselves diseases. Drug companies expand these markets by lowering the cutoff for when treatment is required. For example, if they can convince doctors that high blood pressure is anything over 120 instead of anything over 140, they've greatly expanded the market for blood pressure drugs. And that's exactly what's been happening both for blood pressure and for, for cholesterol. The acceptable limits have been lowered. Uh, so that now I've come to think that any blood pressure is, is going to be considered a bad thing or any cholesterol. Uh, <clears throat> turning out Me Too drugs is not just a matter of wanting a share of a large expandable market. It's also a way of getting or extending monopoly rights. When a new drug comes on the market, the government grants it exclusive marketing rights for a certain period of time. These are the brand name drugs. When the monopoly expires, other companies may sell the same drug, and these are called generic drugs, and they're much less expensive. So when a drug is about to lose its monopoly rights, the same company or different companies may change the chemical composition just enough to patent it and get a new monopoly. That's relatively cheap and easy to do and very lucrative. Prozac, for example, the first of the SSRI antidepressants, which is now available as a generic for pennies, was quickly followed by Paxil and Zoloft and Celexa and Lexapro, all Me Too drugs. Most advertising is for Me Too drugs trying to persuade people, first of all, that they have the condition, and second, that one is better than another, even though there's seldom evidence to that effect. Where do prescription drugs come from? Several analyses have shown that the innovative research was not done in the companies that sell the drugs, the early discoveries, but in NIH-funded laboratories, mainly in universities and at the NIH itself. And there have been several studies looking at this, <coughs> and they all converge on, on the same conclusions, that about 55 percent of the important research came from NIH-funded labs, 30 percent from foreign labs, usually government labs, and only 15% from the companies that make and sell the drug, that manufacture the drug. The drug companies license many of their drugs from universities or from startup biotech companies, and that's especially true of the innovative ones. Even among the Me Too drugs, the progenitor was usually based on NIH-funded or foreign research. Uh, I mentioned Lipitor, the progenitor of Lipitor, the first of those cholesterol-lowering drugs, was a drug called Mevacor, which was manufactured and sold by Merck. It came on the market in 1987, and it's now available for pennies uh, as generic Lovastatin. 
Uh, this drug, Mevacor, was based on NIH-funded research done at the University of Texas and also research done in Japan. Once Mevacor was on the market, it was a simple matter for companies to essentially copy the essential uh, kind of drug and turn out the Me Too drugs one after the other. Now, you might say, okay, what's wrong with that? Uh, the NIH, uh, publicly funded research, gives rise to the early discoveries, and then at some point in the development process, it's handed off to the drug companies. Uh, they license it in, and they continue the development. They pay for the clinical trials, which they certainly do. Uh, and then they manufacture the drugs and distribute the drugs. So what's wrong with that sequence of events? Well, the problem is that these companies expect to be rewarded as though they were the source of innovation, and they're not. And we get to pay twice. Uh, the, the research is taxpayer finance, the NIH is, is publicly funded, and then we get to pay at the drugstore. Now I'd like to go back to the roughly 70 billion the top 10 American drug companies spent on marketing last year. Where does all that money go? The industry will publicly account for only the amount it spends on sales representatives. They send out about 100,000 sales representatives to haunt your doctor's offices. Uh, <clears throat> they'll account for that and for direct-to-consumer advertising and for the advertising in medical journals. But that's only a tiny part of the total. And this is the total that they uh, disclose in their SEC filings and their annual reports. These three functions, these three activities, are a small part of it. In fact, they could have cost the top 10 companies, these three activities, no more than $15 billion last year. That's, that's an estimate, no more. That left $55 billion unaccounted for, $55 billion totally unaccounted for. This is a lot of money to leave lying around without a word about what it's for. It is the elephant in the living room. So where does that money go? Well, we can make some guesses, and here's sort of a list of guesses. We know that the pharmaceutical industry has the largest lobby in Washington. They give generously to political campaigns. So on the left here, we can see that, uh, oh, there it works again, uh, that that's probably a part that comes out of their marketing budget political contributions, front groups, patient advocacy groups, uh, political policy groups. They set up a lot of what, what's called astroturf groups. Uh, these, are, these are groups that are supposed to look like grassroots organizations, but they're really front groups for the industry. Uh, they uh, give gifts to institutions and community and cultural organizations. If you look at the donors to Harvard Medical School, for example, in the Dean's Report of Gifts to Harvard Medical School, you find right up in the top few donors some of the major pharmaceutical companies. But that's a lot of money, but it's not $55 billion. Where does the $55 billion go? Well, I think it goes mainly here, into the education of doctors. Drug companies pay for most continuing medical education, which doctors have to get in order to uh, keep their licenses, their state licenses. They pay for most of that. They sponsor most of the big professional societies. They subsidize their meetings. They pay for other medical conferences, educational materials, gifts, meals, junkets. No doctor has to pay for any of his own meals if he doesn't want to. Uh, in fact, everywhere two doctors are gathered together, so too is the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> this is a lot of money. Well, why 
why all this largesse to doctors? It's simple. They write the prescriptions. Prescription drugs require prescriptions. And they do the clinical research. They write the papers and textbooks. They teach the medical students. They provide the continuing medical education. It is important to win the hearts and minds of the physicians. The medical profession has largely abdicated its responsibility to educate its own, to educate doctors about the use of prescription drugs. And they've ab abdicated that responsibility to companies with a clear conflict of interest. In fact, the companies know it's marketing, not education. If you look at those annual reports, they don't have an education budget. It's marketing, and that's what it is. It's self-evidently absurd to look to a company for unbiased, impartial information about a product it sells. And we know that in other walks of our life. Uh, if we want to know whether to buy a Toyota or a Honda, we don't ask the Honda dealer. We know better than that. And yet doctors will pretend uh, that a drug company can provide education about the products it sells. Also, it's useful in this regard to follow the money. If you want education, if you want to take tennis lessons or French lessons, does the teacher pay you? No, you pay the teacher. But here, the drug companies are paying doctors for this ostensible education that they're providing. And that tells you the real nature of the transaction. They are buying access to the medical profession and they are buying their hearts and minds. Now, some doctors believe that drug companies don't influence them, but they do. There's been plenty of research showing that. They influence them not only in terms of uh, clinical practice, but in terms of research and education as well. So this has real consequences. Now I'd like to turn back here to lobbying and political contributions and the industry's influence in Washington. The pharmaceutical industry has for years, as I said, had the largest lobby in Washington, D.C., and it nearly always gets what it pays for. As just one example of getting what it pays for, look at the Medicare drug benefit. In 2003, Congress passed a Medicare prescription drug benefit, a Byzantine bill that would partially subsidize prescription drugs for seniors. It contained an extraordinary provision. Medicare, in that bill, was expressly prohibited from using its purchasing power to negotiate prices or to set up formularies of the best drugs. It had to pay, said the bill, whatever the companies or the private middlemen chose to charge. To appreciate how extraordinary that provision was, you should know that Medicare does negotiate doctor's fees and hospital payments. But doing the same with prescription drugs, with drug prices, was ruled off the table. You should also know that other government agencies, such as the Department of Defense and the Veterans Affairs System, do bargain for drug prices and get some of the lowest prices in the country. But Medicare, which was about to become the biggest purchaser of them all, was forbidden from using its purchasing power. The person most responsible for pushing this peculiar bill through Congress was Representative Billy Towson, chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Shortly after its passage, he retired from Congress, and shortly after that, was rewarded by being named CEO of Pharma, the pharmaceutical industry's trade association, at a salary of $2 million a year. When Barack Obama was running for president, he expressed outrage over this deal, 
and promised to try to overturn the provision that prevented Medicare from negotiating drug prices. But now look what's happened. All talk of overturning that provision has stopped. And recently, it was revealed that the President and his new friend, Billy Towson, had reached a deal of their own. In return, for leaving that provision unchanged and continuing the ban on Americans buying drugs in Canada, the pharmaceutical industry would support, support Obama's health reform proposals. It promised to put $150 million into ads in favor of the health reform proposals. And it would contribute $80 billion over 10 years to the effort, most of which would be in the form of discounts on brand name drugs in the Medicare program. That amounts to eight billion a year in discounts, which to this industry is small change, and which would probably be offset by the increase in brand name sales over generics that it would stimulate. I think the administration sold itself too cheaply but this deal explains why the pharmaceutical industry is now blanketing the airwaves with ads in support of health reform, the new Harry and Louise ads, which is sponsored by, among others, pharma. And once more, it illustrates the enormous political clout of this industry. We need to reform the industry. Uh, and uh, in, in my book, which was published in, in 2004, paper back in 2005, uh, I spend a chapter talking about all of the reforms that would be desirable. So I won't go over, go over all of them, but just mention a couple of the most important. Uh, the first, and it would take an act of Congress, uh, the first would be to require that the FDA be able to insist that new drugs be compared with existing drugs to treat the same condition, and not just with sugar pills. This would have enormous ripple effects. Uh, it would end the Me Too glut. Now, this would be done as a condition of approval. Uh, and the FDA could be given a lot of discretion here. Uh, it could say, well, yeah, we'd like to have two dr drugs in this class on the market. So it's going to come on the market anyway, even though it's no better than the older drug. They might want to say that. There might be reasons for doing that. Uh, or they could say, um, this new drug is no safer, no more effective, but it's much easier to administer. You can take it once a week instead of three times a day. So that comes on the market. You could have fairly liberal uh, uh, decisions about whether a new drug came on the market. But the point is, it should have to be compared with the older drugs uh, to treat the same condition. We need that information, and that should be done as a condition of approval, and it certainly should not be approved if it's worse than an old drug. <clears throat> the ripple effects, it would end the Me Too glut because very few Me Too drugs could meet that standard, I suspect. There would be fewer drugs and better drugs. It would reduce the huge marketing expenditures because most marketing is for Me Too drugs, trying to convince people that these are really wonderful drugs. If you have a genuinely important drug, a genuinely breakthrough drug, you don't have to advertise it on the nightly news every night. Doctors will read about it, they'll prescribe it. Uh, the, the world, will, it's a cure for cancer, the world will be the path to your door. So the drugs that are being advertised are these Me Too drugs. If you ended that glut, you would probably greatly reduce advertising. And three, you would force the industry to do what it claims it's already doing, that is to put its research efforts on genuinely innovative drugs and not Me Too drugs. So that would have an enormous effect. Uh, second, 
Uh, we need to permit Medicare to regulate prices and to create formularies. Uh, the, the VA does that, uh, and Medicare ought to be able to do that too. And third, we do have to uh, have some, some sort of uh, limitations on the prices charged for drugs that stem from publicly funded research. And this is something, this law is on the books. This can be done. It's just that it isn't done. Um, the, the drugs that stem from publicly funded research and then are licensed into drug companies are so, supposed to be made available to the public on reasonable terms. Uh, and that is the law. So we ought to get serious about that law. Now I won't say anything more than about reforms uh, tonight. Uh, what I'm going to do is, since I have a large audience here, I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you some recommendations for yourselves as patients. First, take as few drugs as possible. Uh, many Americans are now the victims of what's called polypharmacy, which means taking many drugs at once. And this is particularly true of senior citizens. Some senior citizens take five, six, seven drugs every single day. These drugs have not been tested uh, with each other. Clinical trials, which are sponsored by the industry and often designed by the industry, usually test drugs in young people because they're less likely to experience side effects, and they're tested in young people who are taking no other drugs and have no other conditions. So when an older person takes five or six or seven drugs, that, that person is really taking a certain risk. We don't know how they all act together in an older person. So as few drugs as possible. Second, avoid new drugs. New drugs, as I said, are seldom tested in older people or in conjunction with other drugs, and they haven't been on the market long enough to see the side effects. When a drug is approved, uh, the, the data on effectiveness are usually reasonably good. They come out of clinical trials. The data on safety are less good because it takes a larger population uh, and, and a more uh, typical population to see uh, signals of, of danger. So my own, uh, my own practice is never to take a drug that has been on the market for less than three years, never. Uh, and I like five years even better. When I say never, that's probably too strong a statement. I mean, I can imagine a new antibiotic coming in, and it is the only antibiotic that kills this particular lethal organism. So yes, I would take that. The risk would be worth it. Uh, but in general, uh, I have a sort of three-year cutoff. Uh, three, you should remember the importance of lifestyle changes. They are often effective and usually safe. Uh, not many studies, because they are sponsored by the industry, actually compare drugs head to head with lifestyle changes. But there have been a few, uh, mainly dealing with type 2 diabetes and the prevention of type 2 diabetes. And when they compare, exercise and diet with drugs, the exercise and diet blows away the drugs, much more effective. So in certain ways, this is, this is the place to go. Um, four, ignore every single drug ad, ad you see. Push the mute button. Uh, just don't look at those things. Don't ask your doctor whether Nexium is right for you. <laughs> okay. uh, five, beware of internet information. Now, there's some wonderful information on, on the internet, but there's a lot of very bad information, and there's a, 
a lot of information that is sponsored by the industry. Uh, so you have to be very careful about it, know your source. And finally, um, I decided I would do this. Um, let me go back again. Uh, give you a good source. Well, there are a couple of good sources, but one of the best sources out there is a book that's put out every, updated and put out every couple of years by Public Citizens Health Research Group. And it's called Worst Pills, Best Pills. You can go to the web, uh, it's, and I, have, I, I get nothing from this, uh, you can go to citizen.org or public citizen. Go to their health research group. You will see ads for this book. It's a big book. It's really good. Uh, Worst Pills, Best Pills, A Consumer's Guide to Avoiding Drug-Induced Death or Illness. Consumer Reports also has been doing some good work on this in conjunction with the Oregon Health Science University. Uh, they have now been looking at families of Me Too drugs, um, the cholesterol-lowering drugs, the antidepressants, and they'll give you a little table of the relative costs and certain data, what is known about how they compare uh, with, with one another. So that's another place that you might go. Uh, and this is my advertising right here. Uh, that's my book. Uh, I'm going to end now, and I'd be happy to take your questions and comments. And thank you for your attention. After that marvelous talk, you can see why I wanted to steal her notes. Uh, <laughs> my apologies for that. Um, as Dr. Angel mentioned, uh, she will take some questions. We have two microphones here, and uh, if you will come up to one of the microphones, because this uh, will help the audience here, but it's also being podcast. So uh, thank you. I think they're controlling that from the booth in the back. Okay. Um, can we hold this question and try this mic over here, if that's live? All right. So correct check. me. Check. So correct me if I'm wrong, but currently in the United States, the only prescribed drug that patients are able to produce themselves is medical marijuana. And my question is, how in a time when you can't even trust a guy like Obama to not be corrupted by the pharmaceutical industry, that we, that patients are currently allowed within at least states, if not by the federal government, to produce their own prescribed drugs? How is how that possible? That they are allowed to yeah, not how, allowed. How is that possible that within states, governments, that we are currently able to do that if they are prescribed? And how long do you think before Pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry takes control of that, and we're no longer able to uh, produce well, our I, own prescribed drugs. I didn't drugs. know that that was legal in okay. most states. Uh, I thought that was still under, under contention. I think California may have passed a referendum to that effect, but I'm not sure that that is the law in California yet. I think it's being challenged. To so my understanding, currently in the state of Montana, that as of true? 2004, that patients of medical marijuana are able to produce their own. I didn't know that. I okay. Know that. I, all right. Well, I would just suggest everyone look into that because I think that's really interesting. That what other drug that we are prescribed by our doctors are we able to produce ourselves? And that that's a really amazing thing. And that how, how much longer will that continue? Okay, I had a comment on um, the Japan, the Japanese health system is said to be one of the most efficient health systems in the world. Um, they're also had, said to have an FDA system that really works. For example, they look at drugs for efficacy and safety 
but also, as you were referring to earlier, they look at advantage, whether mm -hmm. one drug mm -hmm. has an advantage mm -hmm. over the other. So how has this process worked out in Japan, if, are you aware, and has it saved some money? Uh, that's true of several countries, that they look at cost effectiveness. And drugs are not approved unless they are found to be cost effective. Um, and that's true in here in some of the large insurance companies. They, they have uh, formularies and they'll pay for certain drugs, but not for other drugs. Uh, and they'll reimburse for generic drugs and they'll reimburse somewhat for brand name drugs for which there are no generics and then you have to pay the full freight for other brand name drugs. So this isn't just Japan, this kind of thing uh, is happening all over the world. Uh, Great Britain looks at the cost effectiveness of drugs. Um, one of the things that the drug companies were adamant about in this Medicare drug benefit was exactly that, formularies. And uh, explicitly it was said that uh, cost should be no part of Medicare considerations about paying for drugs. And that's the way it stands. Thanks, Dr. Angel, for a great talk. Um, Thank you. I'm just, I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Washington, and I just wanted to ask you, um, you were talking a lot about how certain drugs haven't been shown to have a lot of benefit um, in certain populations, but certainly in the field of psychiatry, for instance, mm -hmm. the different SSRIs have, you know, different pharmacokinetic profiles, at least that's what they teach you in medical school. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk about how some, some drugs affect certain people, you know, I, you might have an allergy to one statin, but you can use a different mm -hmm. one. Um, and they do studies uh, on a lot of different drugs in, uh, in various populations, looking at polypharmacy, looking at, um, you know, how things are going to work in some mm -hmm. of the sickest patients. So I just wondered uh, if you are, if there's some skepticism that you have for the major peer-reviewed journals, New England Journal, JAMA, all those other ones, and uh, if that research should be viewed with, you know, a, a certain skepticism. Um, the end of your question first. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of skepticism about what's published in medical journals and every article, and particularly articles that are uh, sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry should be read very critically. And one of the concerns I have about education in medical school is that there is no course in how to read the journal. Um, and, and so medical students tend to just kind of look at the last sentence of the abstract and go away thinking that because it was in the New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet or the Journal of the American Medical Association, it's received wisdom. And medical students should be learning how to read the literature critically. Now, the idea that uh, a Me Too drug um, that doesn't work in one patient might work in another patient is certainly something that the industry promotes. There's rather little evidence for that. Uh, but if they wanted to collect the evidence, they could. That is, they could do clinical trials of, uh, of Celexa and everybody who'd had a reaction to Lexapro. They don't do that. They do the same old clinical trials, comparing it with a placebo uh, in, in, in people who have had no experience with, with these drugs. So it's, it's a question that could be answered. If you try to answer it, and this is particularly true for psychiatric drugs, just in terms of, oh, my patient got better on Celexa, so this is better than Lexapro, you're going back to 19th century uh, medicine in which the anecdote is taken as evidence. And when you're dealing with subjective complaints, particularly headache or nausea or, or depression, um, you have to be very careful about the anecdote or the testimonial because the bias is, as you must know, uh, the opportunities for bias are enormous. So that's why you have clinical trials, which was one of the great discoveries of the mid-20th century. You don't throw those over and just go by what you see in front of you. Thank you, Doctor, for taking our questions. And the timeliness of your presentation tonight, tomorrow morning a, a jury 
here in Missoula is expected to reach a verdict against, uh, in May, not necessarily against, but in a case involving Nuvardis and a drug called Zometa. Yes. In the event of a conviction, it's likely an avalanche of tort litigation will be unleashed yes. on the pharmaceutical industry. I was wondering about your thoughts on that matter. Um, a lot would depend. Th this is a, a form of Fosomax, essentially, and uh, what they have found is in large doses, I believe, it can cause something called necrosis of the jaw, in, in which the jawbone essentially disintegrates. Um, a lot would depend on what they knew and when they knew it, uh, in, in my mind. Uh, the company. I'm not a fan of all tort cases uh, against drug companies or anyone else. And uh, I wrote a book about the breast implant controversy in which I thought there were real problems. Uh, but there are sometimes, uh, if evidence is suppressed, as in the Vioxx case, um, uh, or whether they knew uh, and could have taken the drug off the market or made that known, where I would favor a, a verdict in favor of the plaintiff. I don't know the details of this case, so I can't answer it yes or no. All depends. <clears throat> so you did touch on this briefly, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Do you think in general that uh, socialized health care um, is good or bad, and do you favor the current health care reforms that are in progress right now? Could you give me that last sentence again? I didn't... Um, do, you, do you think that the health care reforms in progress right now in this country um, are good or bad? And just your thoughts on... on well, those. I gave a long, long talk this afternoon on that, and I think that the reform efforts are going to amount to very little this time around. Uh, I think they'll turn out to be much less than meets the eye. There'll be a lot of celebration of it uh, because the Democrats badly need to have a bill. Uh, but I don't think the bill is going to be the answer to our problems. I don't think it will uh, provide universal affordable care, not by a long shot. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I was really interested in kind of the the social element involved in uh, in your research here, and uh, particularly your attention to um, uh, uh, consumers kind of remembering the importance of their lifestyle choices mm -hmm. and such. And I was I was really wondering, in light of uh, people uh, paying attention to lifestyle choices and perhaps becoming aware of uh, the dangers in the pharmaceutical companies that you've given light to us today. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you've seen any trends along your research about um, uh, any uh, specific group of people with non-fatal conditions uh, strained from conventional pharmaceutical methods of treatment and resorting to more alternative methods of treatment. Oh, yes. Certainly. Oh, yes. Um, although they, 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 they tend to do it when they're fairly well. And if they get crushing chest pain, then they quickly rediscover <laughs> standard medicine. Uh, it's, it's something that fairly well-educated, fairly affluent people like to experiment with. Oh, so in other words, a lot of time people have tried to stray from, the, from pharmaceutical methods, but once their symptoms come back strong, they often resort to pharmaceutical methods. Would that be accurate? Many of them. Okay. Many of them. I mean, there's some that, that sure. will do coffee enemas and die getting coffee enemas. Um, some people who follow all the way through. But I think for most people, it's it, it's just it's like a insurance policy. If this doesn't work, maybe this will work. Um, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to refer back to the slide that you said was one of the most important for us to see this evening. Mm -hmm. that showed the profit margin for mm -hmm. the industry at 18 percent and everybody else in the mm -hmm. Fortune 500 less than 1 percent. Mm -hmm. And you said it was rather consistent in the top one or two profit margin companies. Mm -hmm. 2008 was a particularly abysmal year for the economy. Right. Do, do you have a sense of what average profit margin would have been, say, yes. over a 10-year period yes. of time? Yes. Thank you. Um, it's a good question. Uh, but I should say that even though the bottom fell out and the 0.9 for all of the industries was very, very low, 
This does show you how recession-proof the pharmaceutical industry is. Uh, usually, the year before, it was 6% for all of the industries. A year before that, about 5%. The Fortune 500 usually goes at around 5%. And the pharmaceutical industry is consistently three to six times higher. Uh, thank you for bringing your message here tonight. Uh, my question goes to the Me Too drugs also, and, and something that you hadn't mentioned as far as being able to uh, can kind of control those costs. Are the um, rebates that the industry, the the insurance industry, gives to the to pharma to get their drugs on their formulary, so that when you have you have a number of new drugs that come out, say in the statin category, and they all maintain their same price level and increase year by year, mm -hmm. but they are put on the uh, insurance formulary is mm -hmm. due to their rebates. And if mm -hmm. rebates were made illegal, they would have to compete on a much more stable footing and it would take a lot of the inflation out of, out of this, mm -hmm. out of this mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot that goes on that's hidden. That's right. Uh, and a lot of collusion uh, between the, the drug companies and the insurers. Uh, and more transparency would, would help there. I'm uh, the pharmacy director at a community health center, and mm -hmm. uh, with that position, I have access to what is called the 340B price, which is similar to like the veterans price or the mm -hmm. public health price. And in, in some areas, we see just tremendous differences between where we buy at, at the bottom and where the and and where a uh, retail pharmacy may be yes. buying and, and I think that that's also would be very yes. indicative of where those rebates are yes. going and in some cases that difference can be so high that at a 25 percent copay in in a in on a drug in the Medicare plan that person may be paying almost the entire amount that mm -hmm. the that the insurance company is paying for it mm -hmm. and then in the donut hole the insurance company would actually be making a huge profit on mm -hmm. what that patient is paying on that drug because of the rebate mm -hmm. that they're getting. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it, 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 again, is one of those hidden things that causes right. inflation to just spiral out of control. Right. right. Thank you. Her book, Chemical Exposure and Disease, Dr. Jeanette Sherman writes of the growing population of intellectual cripples uh, in society caused by environmental exposures. A local Missoula pharmacist said to me not long ago, and I quote, we're killing people with our pharmaceuticals. So I would like to hear your comment on that. And on a second issue, um, in Minnesota, uh, just a few years ago, I couldn't help but notice the tremendous number of, of very, very obese people coming out of large mainstream food stores. And when I mentioned this to a registered nurse who'd practiced nursing for about 40 years, she said, that's not obesity per se, that's malnutrition. So the killing of people with pharmaceuticals and the effects of our uh, deficient food supply in terms of obesity. Um, are we killing people with pharmaceuticals? Yeah, we kill some people with some pharmaceuticals. And we save some people with some pharmaceuticals. So I wouldn't want to make a blanket characterization that, and I certainly don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, uh, died of a stroke from uncontrolled hypertension. He was maybe 63, something like that. Uh, nowadays, hypertension can be controlled. A death from hypertension is bad medicine. It does not have to happen. So there are many drugs that are uh, life-saving and uh, do a lot more good than harm. But unfortunately, we are now seeing an increasing number of drugs that are shown to be unsafe and stay on the market even when the uh, companies see some evidence that they're unsafe. Um, 
Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice for any future graduates of Mont the University School of Pharmacy in terms of uh, helping to correct the um, healthcare reform in the United States. Well, you are very important. <laughs> Pharmacists are very important. Um, I have a pharmacist, it's one of the few sort of local mon pa, uh, actually these are three brothers, uh, uh, pharmacy. These guys do a terrific job of discouraging people from taking drugs. Um, and uh, I, I think the, the, the advice I would give you is beware the embrace of the pharmaceutical industry. That's what's happened to physicians and they will embrace you too. Uh, they'll, they'll kiss your ring and take you out to lunch too. And uh, watch out for that. Good advice. Well, yeah, I guess I have a follow-up question to the last uh, gentleman that was up here. I was diagnosed with cancer about five years ago and I spent the last year researching just everything I wished I would have known when I was diagnosed and didn't have time to find out. And one of the topics I came across was iatrogenic death. So what this is, if you never heard of this, this is people that enter into the healthcare system expecting to get better, but instead of getting better, they end up dead. You know, it's right up there on the last line of your slide. So I've been looking for the latest research on this. It's been very difficult to find. The last thing I could find was 1990 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was a, you're familiar with the study. Yes, so that yes. was 200. 000. Yeah, 248,000 people a year. No, I think they said 100,000. Well, this one, now it's 248,000. There's different estimates. Okay. Okay. But anyway, that's my question, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. whether or not you're aware of Do they even look at this stuff anymore? Because I just haven't been able to find anybody that's, that's doing this research to find out oh, yeah, what the extent that's... of the problem is. And I wondered if you could direct me in that direction of that latest research. I I'm, I'm surprised you can't find more about it. I think if you Googled iatrogenesis, you would find a lot of information. Or, or go to the NIH, uh, I, I mean the uh, National Library of Medicine website, go to PubMed, you would, we well, would find it. I, ha I have done all, you know, I, I've, I've looked at this, I've really been looking mm -hmm, for it. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've taken those steps, and it's, I don't know, you know, it's just diff it's, it seems like it's not something that yeah. anybody is interested in having that information come out? You, you don't know of any recent studies that people have done that? No, and I'm Something you could cite about. that would say, that, you know, yeah. you don't think those numbers are accurate? I think it's very hard to get such numbers. Uh, and um, th there are a lot of iatrogenic deaths. I don't want to minimize that, but I think it would be very hard to come up with a number. I think what it underscores, though, is the danger of getting into the medical system if you don't need to be there. Uh, hospitals are no place to go uh, if, if you're not there for a bona fide condition that requires treatment, if the benefits are not greater than the risk, because there's always a risk uh, of error in any human endeavor, and there is in hospitals too. You haven't seen any recent research on that, though. Uh, time is getting short. Uh, let me uh, mention that there will be time for only two more questions. Uh, and uh, as a courtesy to the audience, please try to keep those questions uh, succinct and uh, on focus. Thanks very much. Here. Um, I recently heard a study uh, that said that 7% of college students use Adderall to increase their academic capabilities. And wait, I was wait, wondering... That 70% of what? 7% uh, of college students uh -huh. use Adderall to increase uh -huh. their academic capabilities. And I was wondering what your professional opinion and if you knew anything about the possible side effects or just with the limited research that's done, if you're aware of yeah. that at all? Uh, I've heard the same figure that, that you have heard. And uh, of course, this is really bad practice to take a drug for such a reason. And these, these kinds of drugs, amphetamine-like drugs or Ritalin-type drugs, uh, have side effects. And uh, students shouldn't do that. Neurological side effects that can go along with the use of amphetamine. We have a neurologist here. <laughs> That's a good question. 
The short answer is yes, her advice is very good. Avoid those drugs. <laughs> One last question over here. We obviously need greater regulation of the pharmaceutical industry. Do we need more than greater regulation? Do we need a stronger role of the government in funding and controlling research and marketing? Um, I think that this is an industry that probably could be regulated even while it remained an investor-owned private industry. Uh, I, I think what needs to be done is, is pretty clear to regulate it. Uh, there are people who believe it shouldn't be a private investor-owned industry and that uh, the NIH should take over this function of discovering and developing uh, new drugs. I don't feel as strongly about this as I did. I, I recognize you from my talk about the uh, health care reform this afternoon. I don't feel as strongly about this as I did about getting rid of the private insurance uh, industry. I, I think it could be regulated from the outside and behave more responsibly. And with that, uh Please join me in once again thanking Dr. Marshall.